Malik Kenyatta, Yukini is co founder and executive director of the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. Um, and DBC FSN operates the seven acre D Town Farm, um, which some of you are going to be visiting on Wednesday. Um, and is also spearheading the opening of the Detroit Food Commons in, um, in Detroit's North End neighborhood. Uh, and that's going to house the Detroit People's Food Co-op. It's been a, a long time coming as a project um, with you know, a lot of vision uh, into shaping it. And Malik's been a big part of that. Um, he also serves as a, a board, uh, the, one of the co-op's board members. Um, Malik's a, a longtime Pan-Africanist and views the work of DBC FSN as part of the larger movement for building power, self-determination, and justice for African people. Uh, he's adamantly opposed to the systems of white supremacy, capitalism, and patriarchy, and he has an intense interest in contributing to the development of an international black food sovereignty movement that embraces black communities in the Americas, the Caribbean, and Africa. Uh, he's also co-founder of the National Black Food and Justice Alliance. Let's uh, give him a welcome. What's up? Uh, I'm gonna greet you in the official Detroit greeting. <laughs> what up though? Uh, peace and blessings and however, you know, however you might uh, accept the, the love that I'm offering you. Hope you're having a good time in Detroit. Um, Detroit, as I'm sure most of you know, is a movement town. It uh, has a very strong history, uh, particularly in the black liberation movement, but also in the labor movement and all kind of aspects of the radical movement. Detroit has had a prominent place. And so I'm very proud to be from Detroit and I see it as being a responsibility to carry that tradition forward. Uh, in some ways, I kind of see, I'm 67 years old, so I kind of see myself as a link between some of the radical activities of the late 60s, early 70s. I was a child in the 60s, but still, 1967, I was 11, so it, I was old enough to know what was going on. It impacted and shaped who I am. And so, in many ways, I'm, I'm serving as a, a link between that time period and the current time period and trying to share some of those experiences with some activists younger than mine, y younger than me. So I want to start by first saying that I personally, and you don't have to you know, adhere to this if you don't want to, but I always start by giving praise to the creator. And different people conceptualize that in different ways. Even sometimes people who consider themselves atheists do consider there to be an initial cause of causes. However you look at that, I'm not trying to impose my view on you. But I am obligated to start by putting that out in front of me. Secondly, I'm also obligated to start by honoring my ancestors, those that African American people share collectively, but also those in my own particular bloodline. Uh, my, my great grandparents, for example, and I'm not going to go into a long story about that, but I'll just say that the uh, resistance to oppression has been a long uh, legacy in America. and. I'm proud to have had grandparents who are part of that resistance, great grandparents who are part of that, and I carry that with me both in my DNA and in my daily work. Thirdly, I wanna say uh, that this presentation is entitled Building Black Food Sovereignty, and although race is a, a mythological thing, right, that's, that's been created, it's not a scientific reality, but at the same time, if we ignore it, if we just try to say, oh, that doesn't exist, we're, we're going down a, you know, we're like an ostrich with our, our, whole, our head in the ground. But for those of you who don't consider yourself to be black, uh, I'm sure that there will still be many things that you can glean from this. So I'm a believer that from the specific experience of groups of people, there are general and more universal experiences that can be drawn out. So I hope you find something of value in the presentation. Also, uh, feel free to talk back to me like, you know, and I don't expect people to agree with everything I say. Uh, in fact, I probably don't agree with everything I said last week, right? <laughs> because I'm constantly evolving. So 
So this is, you know, this is a dialogue. We're going to have Q&A. And I'm sure there's going to be some views that will challenge some things I say, and, and that's fine. That's great. Um, also, before I get into it, I was just talking to my good friend and brother and mentor, Amaha. No, 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 it's not opposite. <laughs> Y'all know Amaha Selassie, right? Y'all know him? Okay, you need to know Amaha Selassie if you don't know him. He, he is one of the leaders, part of the leadership of the Gym City Market in Dayton, Ohio, a food co-op which opened two, two years ago now. And as we're developing the Detroit People's Food Co-op, we're looking at Gym City Market as an example, as in our teachers. And he's been selfless in his giving and sharing with us and sharing lessons that they've learned so that we don't have to make the same mistakes. We'll make other mistakes, but we don't have to make those. <laughs> but I was talking to Amaha uh, just a few minutes ago, and he said, well, there's some people in here, they've been debating about the term food sovereignty and whether or not that's the correct term or whether or not we should use food autonomy. Uh, um, in this presentation, I'm using black food sovereignty. If, if you don't like the term food sovereignty, that's, that's okay. And maybe we'll have some dialogue about why people prefer the term food autonomy. I never heard it before today, to tell you the truth. And you know, one thing about my radical friends is radical friends have like more new language. Every year it's like new. <laughs> you know, it's like you almost, we need a university just to keep up, to, to keep up with movement lingo, right? So this is the first time I've heard, of, heard the term food autonomy. So again, as we're discussing, if you want to share with me why you think that's a more appropriate term, I would be more than happy to, to uh, listen. But this is uh, my good brother now, ancestor, uh, Kadiri Senefera. And Kadiri actually spent a lot of time in this facility at Artist Village. Um, and it helped to develop his consciousness. He became the farm manager of D-Town Farm, the farm run by the organization that I serve as executive director of. And unfortunately, in 2018, he became an ancestor. He succumbed to lung cancer. So I'm beginning the presentation with him. I'm beginning with an ancestor because I think it's important to have ancestral reverence and to acknowledge the shoulders that we stand on, acknowledge the work that our ancestors have put in and to carry that work forward. Next slide. So I wanna kind of take you on a journey um, to describe some of the work that we've been doing here in Detroit related to building black food sovereignty and like all significant work, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, this is protracted work, and the great African-American uh, literary giant John Oliver Killens once said, we need long-distance runners. Um, this struggle is not going to be over next week. It's not going to be over six weeks from now, six months from now, a year from now. Uh, this, it, this is, we measure, around here, we measure participation in decades, right? And the reality of it is an, it's an intergenerational work. And so I want to try to lay out some of the trajectory that we've been on that has brought us to where we are now. So in 1989, um, I was one of the co-founders of a school called Insortima Institute. It was an African-centered school. We were concerned about the fact that the majority of school children in Detroit can go all the way from pre-kindergarten through 12th grade and learn almost nothing about people of African descent. Either ancient history or even more modern history. Even if you talk to the average school child in Detroit right now and ask them about Motown, they'll know very little. Being ahistorical is almost a necessary prerequisite of capitalism continuing the kind of oppression. Because once you start to understand the history, then you can begin to put your current situation in some kind of context. And so there's an intentional effort to keep us ahistorical. A uh, so we started the school in 1989, and frankly, I won't go into the, the whole history. I'll say there was another African Center school that I was working with. I come out of organizations that practiced vigorous criticism and self-criticism, and you know, we, we, we read Mao, we read um, um, Combat Liberalism, some of you might be familiar with that. And so we saw it as our responsibility, and I still function this way. If I'm in an organization 
because you're my friend doesn't mean I'm not going to criticize you. And I'm not criticizing you, right? I'm criticizing the idea because that's how we sharpen our thoughts. And so I was doing that at this African Center School I was a part of, and it was not taken in the spirit of, of growth and positive development, and it resulted in me being put out of the school. So I had no intention on starting a school. Uh, but there were seven other families when I was put out of that school, um, and I, I don't mean to demonize that school either because the woman who started that school is really my mentor or in, in uh, Amharic, I think they say Jegna, a uh, person whose shoulders I stand on. So I'm not demonizing her. We had a difference, which we, by the way, patched over within a year or so. But at the time, it was pretty intense, and it resulted in me getting put out, my two children who were in the third and fifth grade at the time being put out of the school. So I had no intention of starting a school, um, and it came out of kind of circumstances. So I don't want to go into a long detail. But anyway, 1989, we started the school in Sorterman Institute, which I led for 21 years. Um, and it was at this school that really the food sovereignty work that we're doing now, where the seeds of that was planted. Uh, we thought it was important when we say African-centered, not just for children to know who Malcolm X was and what his beliefs were, although that's really important, not just to know how many countries there are in Africa and what mineral resources and who colonized them, although that's really important, not just to know what kente cloth is and mud cloth and be, you know, although that's important to know those things too. Um, but we thought it was important to study what some of the underlying precepts are that provide the undergirding for African culture, whether you're in West Africa, East Africa, North or South. In fact, the great historian, historian Sheikh Anta Job wrote a book called The Cultural Unity of Black Africa. Because while Africa is a very diverse place, for example, there's more than 500 languages spoken in Nigeria alone, there are certain cultural concepts that run throughout the African continent. And so what we were looking at is how can we kind of pull those concepts and share those with the students at the school. And one of those concepts that we found that permeated African culture was this idea of interconnectedness that nothing exists in and of itself, that everything exists in relationship to everything else. Donny Hathaway said, everything is everything. Some of y'all might remember that song. Anybody? Thank you. <laughs> I, need, I need some, some like, age group peers in here so <laughs> to understand my cultural references. Everything is everything. You know, one of the things about so-called Western society, and I, I, I'm always going to say, when I say Western hemisphere, Western, I'm always going to say so-called, right, because all these terms are rooted in Eurocentricity. They're rooted in imagining that Europe is the center of the world and that Europe is the center of our consciousness. And so all of these terms, Western hemisphere, Far East, Middle, all that's some nonsense. It's all some nonsense because it's defining the whole world in relationship to Europe. And of course, we know that many of the cartographers who made the maps and the globes that have informed our understanding of the geography of the planet were made by Europeans. And so, um, so you hear me often say so-called Western Hemisphere. Um, so one of the things about so-called Western, the Western worldview is it tends to segment things and separate things and not look at things in relationship to everything else. So you can have, for example, a person who goes to a prestigious university and earns a PhD and, and knows a whole lot about one thing, but knows very little about, about other things that have impact. For example, when I was running the school, we had at one point a board president who was a medical doctor. Um, she had gone through all, you know, prestigious schools and done her internship and, you know, all the things that you do to become an MD but she knew almost nothing about nutrition. Now, a five-year-old child can tell you that there's a relationship between what you eat and your health, right? But this is the kind of the way knowledge is segmented within the Western Academy. And so we wanted to get away from that, and we wanted to teach this lesson that everything is interconnected so that we can begin to see our lives, the world that we're trying to create, and our movement in a more holistic way. And so for us, one of the ways of doing that was by teaching gardening. 
because by necessity, when you start planting seeds and transplants and cultivating them, you become aware of the relationship between human beings and the plant. You become aware of the relationship between the plant and insects. You become aware of the relationship between weather and the insects. So you start to see how all these things operate as, as a system. They're all parts of one whole. And that's really the lesson that we wanted to teach. And so gardening was a way of doing that. Now, on the more mundane level, we also think it's important that black people in particular, but everybody in American society, breaks this monopoly that the corporate industrial food system has on us. Even if that just means we learn how to grow a, a fucking tomato. Can I say fucking? Okay, I just want to make sure, I want to check. Because I know, we're, can I say fuck shit? Can I say that also? Because that's my favorite, one of my favorite terms. I, I learned that from Dara Cooper, the, the, um, the first executive director of the National Black Food and Justice Alliance. So I just want to check and make sure this is a, a fuck shit uh, safe room, okay? Great, great. Uh, so at some point you'll probably hear me use that term. Um... <laughs> I forgot where I was now. <laughs> um, tomato, grow a tomato. Yeah, grow a fucking tomato. That's where I was. <laughs> so because what it does is it's tremendously empowering to be able to even take that small step and say, oh, shit, we, you mean we can provide for our own needs that we don't need corporations to, to be our caretakers? It's empowering, even if it's just on a small level, right? And so we were teaching gardening for that reason also that we think it's very important for people, you know, to be, to have this holistic view, but also that we know how to grow food because that's an important step towards being autonomous, sovereign, and self-determining. Um, so from 1999 to 2005, we did work at the school that included uh, the development of a food security curriculum, and we were familiar with that, word, that term food security now. And let me also say now that our organization is the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, but we are in the process of changing our name to the Detroit Black Community Food Sovereignty Network. Then depend, depending on what happens with this discussion today, <laughs> I might have to take it back and say, oh, we, we gotta call it the Food Autonomy Network. We'll see, we'll see what happens. <laughs> um, so we developed this curriculum and every teacher in the school, uh, whether the school, whether the teacher was teaching French, which we taught French, by the way, not because we were trying to promote a, a colonial language, but because as a result of colonialism, many black people around the world speak French. Le and let me just share, remember this point, because I'm getting ready to go on a tangent, and I need you to anchor me back to this point when I finish the tangent, okay? So, when I, so I, I grew up in Detroit in the, as I said, the 60s and 70s, and uh, 1969, I had a teacher, I was in eighth grade, who played Malcolm X's message to the grassroots. And it turned my life around totally. I haven't been the same since. Um, where was that? Help me, help me. French, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes. So after being exposed to that, you know, I became very rebellious. And, you know, I, they would, we were required to take either French or Spanish. And I was like, oh, you know, this is some... They brainwashing us, this European colonial language, I, you know. So I failed French five times in school. Seriously, I failed French five times in school. Then in the late 1990s, uh, I had the opportunity to travel to Senegal three times, to go to Cote d'Ivoire, to go to Mali. I was like, damn, I sure wish I had learned that French. <laughs> okay, that's the tangent. Back to the, where was I before that? <laughs> okay, okay, so that's that. So. And I'm going to move past this quickly because this is just the background. This isn't even what I want to talk about. Uh, but we developed the food security curriculum. So every teacher, whether it was the French teacher, whether it was the gym teacher, whether it was a science teacher, whether it was a literature teacher, had to have at least one lesson per week that had a food tie-in. And we were defining this in a broad way. It could deal with actual food security, which is people having enough food. It could deal with the nutritional aspects of food, it could deal with the political aspects of food, it could deal with the economic aspects of food. We were infusing this into the entire curriculum of the school. And then we had a school garden that all students in the school were required to do some work in. 
and different classes did different things, and we tied some of those things into the political conditions. For example, when Hurricane Katrina happened, uh, for a fourth grade class harvested greens from the garden, took them in the school, prepared them, sold bowls of greens, used the money to buy toiletries that they sent down to Louisiana. So we were constantly doing things like that to tie in the food work we were doing with the larger political context. Uh, we also created something called the Shamba Organic Garden Collective because there started being people at the school besides students who were saying, I want a garden in my backyard or in the vacant lot next to my house. There were teachers and parents who were saying that. So we needed a larger container. So we created the Shamba Organic Garden Collective. Shamba is a key Swahili word that means garden. And, um, and we, uh, we would help people develop gardens around the city. We go out on Saturdays, we had a team called the Groundbreakers that would go out and do the most labor intensive work because we found that often that was a barrier for people doing a garden. So we would actually break ground, do the tilling, do the, do the heavy work in hopes that then they would come back and actually plant and, and bring the garden to fruition. Uh, next slide. This is my brother Kalindi E, who is also an ancestor. Kalindi was a master martial artist, I don't know if anybody has heard of him or not, who passed uh, due to COVID in 2020. But this is him uh, cutting a tire. At one point, we were actually growing things in old tractor tires until we learned that there are heavy metals in the tires that can leach into the soil, so we don't do that anymore. But I, I want to big up my brother Kalindi. This is Shaka Senghor at the top uh, about two days after he got out of prison. I think he served 19 years in prison or something like that. I don't know if anybody's heard of Shaka, but he's now a, a best-selling author. His book's been on the New, New York Times. Uh, he's lecturing all across the country and doing prison reform work. But this is like two or three days after he got out of prison and he came to one of the school gardens that we're doing in the community and we took that photo. Next slide. So um, Detroit Black Community Food Security Network grew out of this work because we found we needed an even larger container because there were people in the larger community who were saying we want to get involved in this so we had to expand it beyond the school. So in February of 2006, we created the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, and it is our view now, and it was our view then, that the most effective movements grow organically out of the communities that they're designed to serve. Now, you know, we had the advantage of having studied African liberation movements in Mozambique, Angola, South Africa, Guinea-Bissau, so on and so forth, and you know, and we, we came to that understanding that the movements have to be led by the people themselves in those communities. Other people can stand in solidarity, can provide financial support, can provide other types of support, but it has to be led by the people themselves who are most impacted. So that continues to be uh, the, one of the pillars that guides the work that we do. Next slide. Uh, so I mentioned that we changed the name, we're changing the name from Detroit Black Community Food Security Network to Detroit Black Community Food Sovereignty Network. Um, this is my friend Raj Patel. Anybody know Raj Patel? Uh, Raj and I were in a fellowship together in 2013, and we instantly bonded because we both vehemently hate capitalism. Any of y'all hate capitalism? <laughs> so so I'm, I'm told when I asked, well, who's the audience? Uh, I was told, well, most of them will be anti-capitalism. I was like, yes, because many of the audiences I speak to when I, when I talk about how much I hate capitalism, I get a lot of frowns and maybe one or two people will clap, right? So I'm glad to be in a, in a, a room of fellow capitalist, capital, capitalism haters. <laughs> um, so Raj said to me once, you can have food security in prison. I was like, oh, yeah. So food security, again, means basically that you have enough calories, that you're not hungry. And, you know, I mean, it's obscene to even think in a, a country as wealthy as the United States of America that anybody would be hungry. But hungry is still a reality in America. Uh, but that's still a, lo a low bar that everybody just has enough to eat. And clearly, you, again, you can be in prison and have enough to eat. So clearly what we're struggling for is something more than that. And that something more than that is what we call food sovereignty. And by the way, this term was popularized, many of you might know, by La Via Campesina, an international organization of land workers, the so-called peasants. Um, and so they have an extensive definition if you go to their website. But I'll say basically, in fact, next slide, food, secure, food sovereignty can be thought of as 
uh, the producers and consumers of food shaping and defining that system as opposed to market forces shaping def and defining that system. So we want to do more than just make sure that people in our community and people, humanity in general, has enough food, although we do, we do think that's important. But the reason that we don't have enough food is because we don't have food sovereignty, because we don't have the power to shape the system that provides our food. And so many people think that the way you address food, so food security is by throwing more food at the, at the problem, right? Uh, in Detroit, any Wednesday, uh, you can go around the city and look at church parking lots and you'll see uh, large trucks pulling up, dropping off food that they then give out for free in, in the community. You can do that for the next 500 years and never, never impact hunger in this country because the problem is not that there's not enough food. The problem is that twofold. One, there's not political will to make sure that everybody has food. And secondly, there's not the recognition that everybody is a human being and as a human being is entitled to certain human rights. And so uh, food sovereignty addresses this larger question of defining uh, of, the, of the people, the consumers and the producers, the fisher, fisher people, fisher folk, and the farmers and the pastoralists defining the food system, right? Um, and also, one of the things that we've interjected into this discussion about food sovereignty is that the people who are purchasing this food benefit economically from the dollars that are exchanging hands. In the city of Detroit, for example, and I often tell people, uh, and I might have to change this, but I, I, I have said for several years that Detroit is the blackest city in North America. I'm told just in the last few weeks that Memphis now has a larger percentage of black people than Detroit does. Um, but I'll say we're one of the blackest cities in North America. <laughs> uh, but in spite of that, and Detroit has about 600, the, the feds say 620,000. The, the mayor um, is challenging that and says that there's about 20 more thousand. So somewhere short of 650,000 people live in the city of Detroit, which, by the way, is down from 1.9 million people in 1950. So there's been tremendous depopulation in Detroit. That's a whole nother presentation, though. Uh, but in spite of there being 650 or so thousand people in Detroit and approximately 80 percent of them being so-called African-American, uh, there is only one African-American-owned grocery store in the city of Detroit. And that just opened maybe two months ago. And it's a small store about the size of this room. It's about uh, 1,200 square feet called Linwood Fresh. In fact, I would encourage you to visit there while you're in town if you're able to. Um, and so what we see happening is other ethnic groups coming into the African-American community. In Detroit, it happens to be Chaldeans. And I, I wanna always be clear about this. I'm not anti-Chaldean, so I, I don't want anyone to mistake what I'm saying. Chaldeans are an ethnic group from Iraq who have had a, a centuries-long history of entrepreneurship and came to Detroit uh, starting in the early 1900s and have opened stores, have taken over stores that were formerly run by uh, uh, corporate chains that abandoned Detroit after 1967, after the rebellion in 1967. Uh, in Detroit, it happens to be Chaldeans who own most of the stores. And while some of the Chaldean merchants are, are um, good human beings, and are striving to be good members of the community and treat people with dignity and respect, far too many are not. Now, the problem is not Chaldeans, though, because if you go to, it, to Chicago, it's going to be another ethnic group that controls the stores in the black community. If you go to LA, it's going to be another ethnic group. So it's not the ethnic groups, it's the system, it's capitalism that utilizes ethnic groups to pit them against each other, but often for the exploitation of black people who are on the, on the bottom, and we're not gonna get, get into uh, oppression Olympics, but I'll say our, along with some other folks, are at the bottom of the social economic uh, ladder. Next slide. So one of the things that we've done and, and have become kind of renowned for is we operate one of the largest farms in Detroit called D-Town Farm. Um, and many of you are visiting there on Wednesday. It's a seven acre farm in a city owned park. And I'm saying owned in quotation marks because I don't believe in the concept of land ownership. 
And I, I would suggest that this idea that we have of land ownership is an idea that came here with European colonists who had come from societies that had formerly been feudal societies where you had some wealthy dude who enclosed the commons and then told everybody else, you gotta pay tribute to me, and if you don't, I'm gonna send some brute out to, you know, to do something to you and put you in debtor's prison or, or whatever. So people came here from England, Spain, and France with the idea that you can own the land, that you can own part of the earth. Of course, that was an idea that ran smack into the, the worldview of the indigenous population of the so-called Western Hemisphere, and it also ran smack against the worldview of most African societies. So if I, if I use the term ownership, and I, I, I made throughout the presentation, just know that in my heart of hearts, I, I, I think that's the most ridiculous concept that uh, has been created. And even more ridiculous, you know, you can, now they say you can own a lake, or you can own an island. Really, there's wealthy people who say they own an island. Like, who do you go to, who, who, who has the authority to issue you a deed that says you own an island or you own, it's totally absurd. Um, but we operate in a farm that the city of Detroit says they own. And so we have a license agreement with the city of Detroit that gives us authorization to operate there. Um, this picture was taken last fall. I just thought it was kind of nice looking and uh, part, of, part of the value of this work is it helps you connect with the beauty and the, the majesty of Earth. Next slide. One of the things that we do is we strive to get our community uh, involved in this work and so we've been using this term frequently, uh, build black food sovereignty with us. Um, somebody said, we should stop saying volunteer. You know, this is not just volunteer, this is people building their own liberation. So we kind of combine it. We're still using the term volunteer that people are familiar with, but the overriding concept is build black food sovereignty with us. This is not a charity model. This is not something that we're doing for the black community. This is something that we, we're putting in place, a mechanism where we can collectively work together for our collective good, which is much different than the charity model. So we encourage people to volunteer with us at D-Town Farm on Saturday and Sunday mornings from 8 a.m. until noon. Uh, the sister in the photo is our board president, Shakira Tyler, um, who is a brilliant uh, sister and will be uh, succeeding me as executive director. In fact, we're actually moving to a co-executive directorship. Uh, I am stepping down from the position of sometime next year. We're trying to pinpoint the exact date uh, because there's been some changes in the uh, building schedule, the construction schedule of the building I'm going to talk about in just a minute. But she will likely be one of the two co-executive directors. I want to put her on your radar, Dr. Shakira Tyler, brilliant young sister originally from Philadelphia, and again, she currently serves as our board president. This is her uh, showing some young people at the farm, red okra, and you know, it's amazing how many people have no relationship to the food that they eat. Um, Many people don't know potatoes come out of the ground. The potatoes grow in the ground, right? Many people have never seen asparagus grow. Many people have never seen uh, Brussels sprouts grow. How many people have seen Brussels sprouts grow? Quite a few folks, good. Uh, it freaked me out first time I saw it. I was like, wow, they grow on a stalk like that? But we're so disconnected from our food. So she was exposing them to this red okra and showing them the seeds inside. And uh, for some of these young people, it can be a life-changing experience. Next slide. So at D-Town Farm, we grow more than uh, 40 now different fruits, vegetables, and herbs. Uh, we're not growing 40 things at any one time. You know, many things are seasonal. And in Michigan, we have a relatively short growing season, usually from April-ish to October or so. And you know, depending on the weather patterns and you know, they're sh shifting and you know, each year is a little different. Um, unlike my friends in California and Florida, and, you know, they say, oh, we can grow stuff all year long. Um, but in that, so, so even in that short growing season, some things we can grow in the spring that are cool weather crops, and then usually those same cool weather crops we can grow again in the fall, and then some things are hot weather crops that require more heat, and we grow those in a more intense uh, uh, the warmer months of the summer. 
So we don't have 40 things growing at one time, but over the course of the growing season, we grow about 40 different things. This is one of our founding members who's also an ancestor now, Jackie Hunt. She also succumbed to COVID in 2020. COVID hit Detroit bad. I mean, I, I can't tell you the number of people that were checking out of here in March and April of 2020. Um, but we, we always want to honor her, Mama Jackie, we call her. And she's standing in a field of collard greens. And I, I don't know if this is true for not, or, or, or not, but there's a rumor going around Detroit. I think it is true. There's a rumor going around Detroit that the sweetest collard greens in Detroit come from D-Town Farm. I don't know, I can't prove that, but this is, you know, this is the word on the street. Uh, <laughs> uh, but we grow all kinds of other things. Watermelons, kale, potatoes. Anybody know what that is, that tall crop right there? Anybody been to Jamaica before? Kalaloo. Oh, she, you knew that right off the bat. <laughs> it's actually a type of amaranth, green amaranth, that is popularly called in Jamaica Kalaloo. But Jamaican Kalaloo is different than Trinidadian Kalaloo and is different than Haitian Kalaloo. Uh, but in, in Jamaica, green amaranth is considered to be Kalaloo. So we grow that, uh, peppers, beans, all kind of stuff, you know, 40, 40 different things. Next slide. This is a group of teenagers from Detroit who were harvesting radishes. And they were like freaked out, like pulling radishes out the ground, like, what? <laughs> and uh, you can see some of them. They were like, yo, yo, you know, this is my radish. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, the point is that for many young people, this is their first exposure to agriculture. And I, I was talking to uh, somebody earlier, I think Kiki, and um, they mentioned that, um, that I, I had told a story when they were at D-Town Farm some years ago about the trauma that black people have associated with our enslavement and working of the land in order to create white wealth and also the system of sharecropping that followed that. And so for many black people, they wanna get as far away from farming as possible. And, but also, you know, some people have widened my perspective and I, I understand now that it's not just black people, that many Mexicans, for example, because have had trauma with, uh, related to their exploitation uh, in agriculture and also, you know, are discouraged from participating in it. And so this is a work that, you know, in, in our community, this is the work that we have to do to reframe this work uh, from people seeing it as an act of exploitation of our labor to an act of self-determination. And so an important part of our work is the reframing of agricultural work. Next slide. Uh, we also have a harvest festival each year uh, because we realize that farming is not for everybody, right? Um, everybody ain't cut out for it, to tell you the truth, just to be frank about it, because this it's labor intensive. My back is hurting right now, to, to, to tell you the truth. You know, it ain't for everybody. Um, but some people who may not come out and volunteer at the, at the farm and put their hands in the soil will come out to hear a band playing, speakers and workshops and all those things. So this is a way of broadening our reach into the community by having this har annual harvest festival to bring out folks who the, the actual farming part doesn't resonate with them but all of the kind of activities that can be related to that uh, resonate with them. So we, we do this each year in September, generally in September last year, it was in October. Next slide. This was our farm crew last year. Um, and we sell our produce at a stand in front of the farm on weekends. For the last, up until a couple years ago, we were selling at farmer's markets in the city. But because of COVID, the farmer's markets we were selling at shut down. And then one of the, the main one that we sold at the Wayne State University Farmers Market discontinued operation altogether uh, this year. So at this point, we sell at our farm. We have some wholesale customers that we sell to. Um, and that's mainly how we're moving the produce. Next slide. Something else that we're involved in um, that I want to give big, 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 big uh, credit to, uh, to several black women. One, Tepfira Rushdan, uh, who was the conceptualizer of the Detroit Black Farmer Land Fund, and also to DBCFSN board member Aaron Johnson, who you see uh, in that photo holding up something, uh, and also uh, board member Shakira Tyler, who you saw earlier, and uh, Jerry Hebron, who is the 
uh, director of Oakland Avenue Urban Farm. So Detroit Black Community Food Security Network partners with Oakland Avenue Urban Farm and Keep Growing Detroit to create the Detroit Black Farmer Land Fund, to create it and to operate the Detroit Black Farmer Land Fund. To date, the fund has raised money primarily through individual donations and has been able to give grants to 70 black farmers in Detroit to enable them to buy the land that they're farming on. And then last year, they also made the funds available to, to purchase infrastructure. And so, frankly, these young black women have been able to do what, when we started the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, we thought we were going to do, but we're not successful in doing. And that is, we were trying to create this umbrella that could bring together black growers within the city to work in a common fashion for our collective well-being. Uh, that, that didn't happen like that. You know, we thought it was going to happen, and it, it didn't. But these young sisters have been able to make that happen. They've been able to pull together large numbers of black farmers in the city of Detroit and get them working together through the Detroit Black Farmer Land Fund. Next slide. We also think that youth development is important. And let me go back to, I, I to, told you in 1969, I had a teacher that played Malcolm X's message to the grassroots, right? Y'all remember me saying that? And it changed the tra tra trajectory of my life. Um, so at that time, 1969, 1970 or so, I thought, and many of my peers thought, that the revolution was going down in the next two or three years and it was gonna be a wrap. Capitalism was done, black liberation was coming in, we were very short-sighted. Now, in, in reality, had COINTELPRO not interceded, the possibility of that existed, right? But we didn't really understand how resilient the system is, even though it's deeply flawed and will fall. It will, you know, uh, you know, because of its own internal contradictions, but also because hopefully we're trying to kick the legs out from under it at the same time. Um, but Again, we were very short-sighted, and we, we thought, you know, two, three, four, five years, we got this, you know. Uh, no, nah, not exactly. So we now understand that not only is this a protracted struggle, and I quoted earlier John Oliver Killens, who said we need long-distance runners, but it's also an intergenerational struggle. And so we realize that if this movement for food sovereignty is going to be sustainable, not only do we have to use sustainable farming methods, but we have to intentionally bring young people into this movement so that the movement has sustainability, right? We can't have everybody with beer, gray beards and gray hair, you know, trying to, trying to run. We need young people. Young people are the spear of the revolution, right? In every revolution. And so we, we learned that lesson. So now we are intentionally working with young people and bringing them in to this work. And we do that through two youth programs. Uh, one is called the Food Warriors Youth Development Program, which is run by my sister, Mama Hanifa Ajuman. Mama Hanifa also taught at Insortima Institute, the school that I directed for 20 years or so, and, um, and came over to the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network in 2010. Um, this is, she's with a brother named Jerome, who was a student at, who is a student at University of Michigan, and heard about our organization, was kind of attracted to the radical politics, and uh, came on board and started working with our youth program. The, uh, the smaller photo, is a student at one of the schools that we operate at, which is called the Barack Obama Leadership Academy. I'm not, frankly, in love with that name, but uh, <laughs> I, I didn't choose the name, let me just say that. <laughs> um, but the, the point is that this is some garlic that the young people at the school grew. And I'm hating a little bit, just a little bit. I know it's not good to hate on children. But I have to be honest and say I'm hating just a little bit because the garlic that the children grew th that year was bigger and more robust than the garlic that the <laughs> adults at D-Town Farm grew that year. Next slide. Our second youth program is called Food and Flavor. That's the hip hop spelling of it, right? Um, and also this program was conceived by Mama Hanifa and is run by Mama Hanifa. This is for teenagers. And so we combine the, the agricultural skills that we teach to the younger people in the Food Warriors program with entrepreneurial skills. And so again, we're not teaching capitalism. 
but we are teaching them. And, and you know, because you're anti-capitalist, that doesn't mean that you don't believe in commerce. Some people, I think, sometimes mistake that, right? Uh, it's not that we don't. It, it's not that we don't believe in commerce. It's like how who controls it? Who's who's controlling the means of production and distribution? Who who benefits from it? Those are the the questions we're concerned about. So we combine teaching entrepreneurial skills with the agriculture. So they, uh, like one year they grew cucumbers, they made pickles, they sold the pickles. Each one of them walked away with about $80 in their pocket, then all of a sudden urban agriculture starts making a whole lot more sense to them. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, this big project that we're working on uh, which is a $21.6 million project, and um, it's called the Detroit Food Commons. Um, people have been saying, well, where did you get the $21.6 million from? Well, let me tell you, we didn't get it from the People's Liberation Fund. <laughs> That's kind of a joke. <laughs> we got it from some filthy capitalists. I mean, most of it's debt financing. It, you know, we owe, we, we borrow money, we owe it to them. And it has made me hate capitalism even more than I hated it before, because I've had to deal with some of them up close and personal. Um, but we're building this building, which is now about 75% complete. You can drive by it on Woodward and Euclid while you're in town, um, called the Detroit Food Commons. It's a 31,000 square foot, two-story building the cornerstone of which will be the Detroit People's Food Co-op. Um, so let me be clear that community gardens are not going to uh, dismantle capitalism. Food co-ops are not going to dismantle capitalism, be clear. But if framed correctly, they can be important steps to begin to break the monopoly that capitalism has on our minds about how we provide for ourselves. It can be an important um, kind of pre-revolutionary activity, maybe we'll call it, to, to, to begin to nurture within people that we have the power within ourselves and we have the ability to galvanize our own, uh, our own power, our own attributes in order to do things for ourselves. And so... Um, so we're developing the Detroit People's Food Co-op. We've been working on this since 2010. And again, I started out and I've said a couple times that this is a protracted struggle. You know, this stuff doesn't happen in a year, two, three, four years. It requires putting your nose through the grindstone and keeping it there for a protracted period of time to make these things happen. So we started working on this in 2010 and we're almost at the finish line now. Uh, so that'll be on the first floor, the People's Food Co-op on the second. And by the way, there's several People's Food Co-ops um, in Michigan. There's the Ypsilanti People's Food Co-op. There's the Ann Arbor People's Food Co-op. There's the, um, the Kalamazoo People's Food Co-op. And many of these organizations, that terminology you know, probably sounds familiar because the, this idea of people's institutions kind of was popularized in the 1960s by organizations like the Black Panther Party. So in many ways, we're continuing that radical tradition and bringing forward some of that language with us. On the second floor of the building, we'll have four shared use kitchens that can be used by food entrepreneurs of various sizes to produce food in a licensed kitchen. And those kitchens are called the Kuji Chagulia kitchens or the Kuji ki uh, kitchens for short. Uh, some of you may know that Kuji Chagulia is a word from Kiswahili that means self-determination. Um, Many African Americans began using various Kiswahili words and phrases in the 1960s. Um, many of them would have considered themselves to be cultural nationalists. Um, Amiri Baraka, for example, was uh, one of the most well-known at that time cultural nationalists. He evolved over time, and uh, I won't go into that. That's a long story. Um, and the controversial Maulana Karenga also was uh, considered to be a, a cultural nationalist and helped to popularize these terms. But they were, Kiswahili was chosen because as you know, the African continent was colonized, uh, the entire continent except for Ethiopia and Liberia. And Liberia was basically started by the United States. So although it wasn't technically a colony, it was always kind of like a mini America. They still use the US dollar in Liberia. 
Um, Ethiopia was occupied briefly uh, until uh, I think it was Menelik uh, ran the Ethiopians out at the Battle of Adawa, and then uh, Emperor Selassie uh, appealed to the, the League of Nations during uh, World War II. And so it was occupied briefly by Italy, but never colonized. And so those are the only two countries. But because of colonization, um, there are many European languages that are spoken on the African continent, as well as the many indigenous languages. And so as the idea of Pan-Africanism began to evolve, this idea that Africa can only be free and strong as a united entity and not as these you know, 54 different so-called nation states, is this idea began to emerge, which by the way emerged in the so-called Western Hemisphere, it didn't emerge on the African continent. It emerged with people like Edward uh, uh, Wilmot Blyden and um, other folks, mainly from the Caribbean, who had this idea of a, of a united Africa. And then many of the African leaders, such as Kwame Nkrumah, um, came to the United States or were in London and were exposed to these ideas and took them back to the African continent. But part of this idea of Pan-Africanism, in, in addition to trying to have, um, eliminate these colonial boundaries, in addition to trying to have a, a continent-wide currency, they also were beginning to look at language. And so Kiswahili is the largest non-so-called tribal, I don't like to use that word, uh, language, uh, on the African continent because it was created primarily as a trading language. And so it's the most widely spoken language in East, Central, and parts of Southern Africa. And so many people on the African continent, as well as many cultural nationalists here in the United States, began using Kiswahili for that reason. Uh, so we have the Kuji Chagulia kitchens, and then we also have on the second floor of the building what's called Imani Hall. Imani, remember earlier when I told you I was put out of an African center school because I had a difference with the director? Well, the, the director's name is Imani Humphrey. Well, she's an ancestor now as well. And so we've named this hall in honor of her uh, because she was a significant figure in Detroit, uh, both in terms of institution building, uh, in terms of uh, black radical thought, and in terms of embodying what it means to be dedicated to our movement for decades and decades. Next slide. So we had a groundbreaking uh, last April 23rd for the Detroit Food Commons. And uh, these are board members and staff members of the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network at the groundbreaking. Uh, that's me at the groundbreaking running my mouth, smashing uh, capitalism and white supremacy as usual, Mama Hanifa. And then this is uh, Angela Lugo Thomas, who's a board member of the Detroit People's Food Co-op. Next slide. Uh, so this is the architect's uh, drawing, rendering of what the building will look like. This is what it looked like November 9th of 2022. Next slide. This is what it looked like December 21st. And I think this is a video. Can you clip on that? Click on that. Okay, thank you, next slide. And this is what it looked like this morning. <laughs> next slide. So that's the work we're doing here in Detroit. I'm going to try to go into hyperspeed now so I don't take too much time. Uh, so we know that the oppression that black folks and other folks in Detroit face is not unique to Detroit that the system that oppresses us, oppresses folks in Ohio, in New York, in California, Ghana, Mexico, Nicaragua, Jamaica, the whole world. Capitalism is a global system, or some people like to use the term racial, racial capitalism is a global system. And so while it's very important that we do work where we are, it's also very important that we connect our work with the work of other people who are striving for liberation in this country 
as well as people internationally, one of the most important lessons that Malcolm X taught us was the lesson of internationalism, that um, you look around the world at people who have a problem similar to yours, you see what they did to solve their problem, and you'll know what you have to do to solve your problem. And the last year or so of Malcolm X's life were really spent traveling and building those international relations so that we're not just challenging capitalism within the context of the American nation state, but we're doing it on a global level. And so the National Black Food and Justice Alliance is a national alliance of more than 50 black organizations who are striving to build black food sovereignty. Some are building food co-ops, such as the incredible Gym City Co-op in Dayton. Have y'all been to Gym City in Dayton yet? <laughs> okay, I only heard one, yes. So the rest of y'all, the rest of y'all need to find a ticket to Dayton so y'all can see what's, what's happening there. Uh, some are building co-ops such as Gym City Co-op. Some are doing farming such as the SIP Culture Farm in Jackson, Mississippi. Some are working on policy work such as the folks who are working with the Heal Food Alliance. But we all have the common goal of building food sovereignty and of being anti-capitalist and anti-white supremacy. Um, next slide. So one of the things the National Black Food and Justice Alliance does is we have convened black co-op operators. And this photo was actually taken at the up and coming food co-op conference last year in Madison, I think. Madison, Wisconsin last year. Um, and when I first started attending the conference about eight years ago, there were maybe three or four black people there. And then over the years, the black population started increasing. And then one year, I just like gangster the room and call all the black people in the room and say, let's, you know, let's build a, uh, you know, some solidarity among ourselves. And then eventually, uh, we were able to bring most of those folks in relationship to either in direct membership to or in relationship to the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, which has the organizational bandwidth to kind of hold this work. Um, the Alliance also addresses black land loss. Uh, one of our members is Savvy Horn, who operates the Black Land Law Center in North Carolina, and we're trying to stem the tide of black land loss, which is continuing. You know, most of us know about the history, the egre egregious history of the USDA and the discrimination in loans and how many black farmers lost their land as a result of that. But those things are continuing. And so we've been involved in trying to stem the tide of black land loss. Uh, we have established one of what will be several agroecology agro centers at HBCUs, historical black uh, colleges and universities. The first one was created at FAMU, Florida Agriculture and Mechanical uh, University. And we've been involved in influencing policy particularly working on the Justice for Black Farmers Act with Senator Cory Booker. In fact, specifically, Leah Peniman, somebody mentioned Leah earlier, of Soul Fire Farm, uh, was one of the ones who was involved in that work with Senator Cory Booker to, to draft the Justice for Black Farmers uh, Act, which still has not passed, by the way. Next slide. Uh, one of the incredible things about the National Black Food and Justice Alliance is that unlike many small organizations, it has made it past the first generation of leadership. So I, I mentioned Dara Cooper when I, when I used the term uh, fuck shit earlier. I told you she taught me that term, uh, who was the first executive director. And some organizations never make it past that. So we were able to make it past the first generation of leadership and now have two brilliant black women who are the co-directors of the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, Dr. Jasmine Jackson, and uh, Cicely, uh, is this being recorded? Uh, I, I know Cicely's last name, I really do, but uh, I'm having a brain freeze right now. Um, but they are the, the two uh, co-executive directors of the Alliance, and then uh, in the rear photo, you see some of the, uh, the leadership team. Cicely Garrett, thank you. I had it right on the tip of my tongue. Um, these are some of the members of the leadership team. So we have collective leadership with the alliance. This is Savvy Horn with the locks and the glasses that I mentioned earlier with the Black Land Law Center. Next slide. We've also been involved in some direct action campaigns. And this uh, campaign, uh, well, there's two, two things here. One 
is working with the Federation of Southern uh, uh, Co-ops to, um, again, try to stem the tide of black land loss. And then we've also been involved in Illinois uh, with an effort to stop a pipeline which is running through Pembroke, Illinois, a historically black farming town a few miles outside of Chicago. <coughs> Next slide. Uh, study is important. Um, and um, Amaha was telling me that where he's staying, the folks have the, all these books that are like just radical, you know. <laughs> And, and it's, it's really, it's important, you know, I mean, we have to study both past revolutions, even though this is a very unique situation here, there's a lot we can glean from revolutions that have taken place in other parts of the world. Uh, but we also have to study the movement in this country. You, you know, we have to study what happened here in the last 50 years and have a profound understanding of that. And we have to understand the contemporary dynamics that we're faced with. And although all of us are like really smart, I'm sure, None of us is as smart as, uh, as all of us. And so we have a book club with the Alliance that meets regularly uh, to study collectively and discuss these issues. Uh, these are some of the things that they've read. Hammer and Hole by Robin Kelly, uh, who's a, a great friend of the Box Center, which I, I think the Box Center is part of the sponsorship of this event. Um, Freedom Farmers by Detroiter Dr. Monica White, uh, which has become a, a, a very important text in movement work uh, throughout the country. In addition to that, we also have what's called the Mutual Aid and Resource Capacity Fund. And so, uh, primarily because of the leadership of our first executive director, Dara Cooper, she's been able to get more kind of liberal or radical leaning philanthropy to donate pretty significant sums of money to the Alliance, which it then is able to dole out to its member organizations to help with crises they might be facing or to help with expansion plans that they have. It's been a very helpful fund for a number of the members of the Alliance. Next slide. I mentioned earlier that we opened the first of what will be several agroecology centers, and that was at FAMU. It's called the Lola Hampton Frank Pender Center. It was named after two uh, ancestors from that particular geographical area near Tallahassee, and uh, the idea is to help train farmers who are participating in commercial, industrial agriculture to help them transition to agroecology, which is immensely better for the planet. Next slide. Uh, these are some of the leaders of the Agroecology Center. This is Dr. Uh, Jennifer Taylor and Dr. Uh, Kwasi Dinsu, who are the co-directors of the Agroecology Center. And then the three that you see there, Savi Horn, Dr. Monica White, and Dara Cooper, Dara fuck shit Cooper, is, uh, is uh, they're part of the, the advisory team that helps to, to shape the center. Next slide. Uh, one of our members, Piper Carter, is a member of the, um, of the leadership team of the Alliance. Piper is a, 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 a seminal pillar in Detroit's activist community and has been very active in the hip hop community in particular, but she's the environmental justice officer for the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. Next slide. So in addition to the local work, the national work, there's also this international work that we've been involved in. The U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance every year gives out a food sovereignty prize. And uh, in 2022, we nominated Food Sovereignty Ghana for a Food Sovereignty Prize, and they in fact won that award. So they asked me to MC the program and to present the award to the group, and so that was able to bring this group Food Sovereignty Ghana onto the uh, uh, kind of the radar of many people inside of the United States. Next slide. This is my brother Anand Laloli, who uh, who I stand on his shoulders. He's the one that introduced me to the food movement, right? I was involved in, you know, the black liberation movement, but I didn't really understand the relationship between food and black liberation. So he helped me to make that connection. He's originally from Guyana, South America, but he's lived in Toronto since the 1980s. Interestingly, we actually met each other in the early 1980s playing in reggae bands. I'm a musician and I played in Toronto a lot. And at the time, he was playing in Canada's top reggae band called Truths and Rights. 
and we did many shows together. So we knew each other outside of the food realm. And then we kind of got disconnected for 15 years. Then in 1999, we reconnected, and he started talking about this idea of food security and food sovereignty. I was like, huh, what? And so he's doing incredible work, he and the people he works with, none of his work is individual work, in Toronto. Um, and they've been able to do something in Toronto which is very unique, and that is that they've been able to get the municipal government of Toronto to create an office that is funded by the city called the Office of Anti-Black Racism. And through the Office of Anti-Black Racism, they've been able to create the Toronto Black Food Sovereignty Working Group. No watered down language, you know, I mean, like pretty, it's pretty straight ahead with what, with what they're doing. So this is an important example to watch. Uh, you know, I don't have a lot of faith in municipal governments, the United States government, or none of them governments, frankly. Uh, I, think, I think all the governments on the earth are corrupt. Uh, but, but still, they've been able to push the envelope and push that municipal government to do some things that are far beyond what any, any municipal government in the Western Hemisphere has done. Well, excuse me, any, any municipal government in the United States or Canada has done. I'll stop at that. Next slide. Uh, these are some more things that they, they've done, the Black Food Sovereignty work in Toronto. Uh, next slide. Um, in November of last year, uh, because of the work he was doing in Toronto, folks in Montreal said, well, will you come here to Montreal and help, help us to put together this black food sovereignty work that we're doing there? He invited me to present with him, and we presented, and that work is ongoing in, in Montreal as well. Next slide. Uh, now, I'm going to run through this real quick. Um, I'm, in fact, I'm probably not going to go through all these slides, or if I do, I'll do them like really, really quick. But in November last year, I went to Yaoundé, Cameroon, to a meeting of the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa, an organization that is working to combat um, so-called Western uh, industrial agricultural methods that are used uh, in Africa and to replace them with agroecology, which is more in line with the traditional indigenous ways of growing uh, that people have used traditionally. Next slide. Um, I don't want to go through the history of, of colonization in Cameroon, but you should read about it on your own. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Uh, so the, this is the fourth biennial food systems conference by this group, and um, the theme was mobilizing African food policy and action for healthy food systems. Next slide. So the conference was attended by more than 170 people from 30 different African countries. Uh, one of the themes that emerged from the conference was called My Food is African, or in French, Je mange African, uh, because on the African continent, there's an increasing encroachment of, of, of foods from the United States and the so-called Western Hemisphere. Uh, you'll see more and more places selling burgers and pizzas and things like that. And also, because of the, um, perhaps there's class implications in this, that people feel, um, you know, that if you're eating food that comes from, is like the food they eat in America, that somehow you're better, you're elevated, that you're, you know, you're not eating ground nuts and, and yams, you know, those are for, you know. So, so we're trying to advance this idea that the traditional foods of Africa are not only nutritious, are not only more climate resilient, but also are, are, you know, are valuable because, they, because of the cultural value uh, that they have. So this campaign was launched, My Food is African. Uh, part of the conference was to try to figure out how to bring these 54 different food policies by the independent nation states, oh, excuse me, not independent, by the most of our neo-colonial nation states of Africa into one cohesive policy. Also, uh, the proceedings were in both French and English. Next slide. A number of people brought traditional foods with them that they are growing and selling, and that was part of this My Food is African campaign, just seeing the wide variety of foods that are being produced in Africa. Next slide. Uh, this is a video, but, well, you know, it's got audio, so, and we're having problems with the audio, so keep going past that. Um, so, 
you know, topics were addressed such as uh, the strategic direction of how to transform African food systems, uh, why current mainstream food security approaches are not working, uh, and also climate change. Many of the people had come back from uh, the COP, was it, which COP was it this time? I forgot, in Egypt. Which COP was it? 27, thank you. Many folks had just come back a few weeks uh, prior from COP27 in Egypt and are very concerned about uh, the climate crisis that's impacting all of us. Next slide. Uh, we had a chance to visit in one of the rural areas, uh, an agroecology center, and we were welcomed to the town by drumming and dancing. We're not gonna watch that video, keep moving. Uh, more slides of the Agroecology Center, keep it moving. Um, because there were people from so many different countries, we had a dinner one night where people prepared their traditional foods in different way, in tr traditional ways. And uh, I'm a vegan, and I'll tell you, most of the time when I'm in Africa, I have a very hard time. Because, you know, there are some people in Africa who are vegan, but not too many. Um, and probably that the same is true for Detroit, you know. I often have a hard time as a vegan in Detroit. But this particular evening, there were, next slide, there were many foods that I was able to eat and I was, I was very pleased to be on the African continent with a full plate of food that was all plant-based and traditional foods. Next slide. On the last day of the conference, I had the opportunity to address one of the plenary sessions and um, I reminded the um, participants of the origins of the idea of Pan-Africanism in the so-called Western Hemisphere, and that any approach to build African unity has to be global and has to make sure that it's reaching out to the African diaspora as well. Next slide. Uh, again, many meaningful connections made with people throughout the continent, and we're continuing to nurture those relationships. Next slide. Uh, but perhaps the most meaningful uh, connection I made was with uh, Karubel Tadele, Tadele who is from Ethiopia but lives in Dallas, and he is the communications director for the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa. So we have had the chance since we've been back from the conference to do some uh, webinars together. Undoubtedly, he'll be in Detroit at some point in the near future, um, and he is going to be key in building this uh, partnership between the Black Food Sovereignty Movement in the United States and the uh, movement happening on the continent of Africa. Next slide. Uh, after that, I hung out. I'm not going to show you all those. We'll just, we'll just keep moving past that. Keep moving. And so I'm going to end as I began. I began with my, my brother, Kadiri Senefra, who's an ancestor. And I'm going to end with Sister Charity Hicks, who is one of the founders of our organization and was for many years our secretary. And in 2014, she was in New York going to address uh, a meeting of, I think it was called the Left Forum. And she was standing at a bus stop in a car jumped the curb, hit her, kind of smashed up against a pole. She was in a coma for about a month, and then she passed. And so she is an icon in the city of Detroit. She was very involved in the water struggles. And one of the things she has always reminded us to do is to wage love. And so I would encourage you to do the same, that whatever our political ideologies might be, whatever our philosophies might be, whatever area we have chosen to put our energies into make the world a better place that love guides our work. Thank you. Okay. First and foremost, thank you. Our organization represents the disparities of the blight, meaning the trash in and out, um, so on and so forth. Um, trying to bring awareness to our people as to how this all connects to us mentally, physically, financially, and emotionally. Okay, my grandfather grew um, a garden when I was a kid in Kentucky. So I know the sweetness of a true garden Right, the greens, the tomatoes, the, the cucumbers, the, all of that. So I get it, right? But how do we bring awareness to our people 
to the importance of growing our own food, taking, I won't say necessarily taking back our own land, but in essence to utilize our land to make it better for us as a whole. It's not a black or white thing, it's a people thing. So how do we bring awareness to, because I think we're speaking to the choir when we're in here. How do we take it back home and, and, and take home the message? What do we do? So whenever people ask me, what do we do? I, I get a little nervous because <laughs> I don't know. I, don't, you know, I mean, I have some ideas, but um, you know, the dynamics are different in each place. So I want to acknowledge that. So what we did in Detroit might be different than how you do it in Dayton. But I, I'll say that the presentation I just gave is basically my take on how we do it. That we build microcosmic models of the larger society that we're trying to bring into being. Uh, and I'll, I'll just, by way of answering your question, I'll give you a short story and say that I have another friend who also became an ancestor a few years ago. M many of my peers, by the way, are now, most of the brothers who I came up in the movement with are ancestors. And I'm 67, and some of them didn't make it to 60. Um, but one of those used to come in my backyard all the time when I was working in my family garden, and he would kind of stand around and kick it with me. He would never pick up a shovel, but he, he kind of kick it with me, and you know, we have some conversation. Then one day, I was at a conference in Atlanta. He called me. He said, man, I just went to the supermarket, and I went to buy some tomatoes, and I looked at the price, and he said, I thought about it, and I, I said, Malik doesn't buy tomatoes. And then I went and looked at some greens. I looked at the price, and I said, Malik doesn't buy greens. And so for him, it was the economics that hit him, right? That was the, the thing that kind of won him over, that he saw the economic savings that we can incur by growing our own food and not paying all this money to these filthy capitalists. Um, but there's no one way that we're going to win people over. So again, we have youth programs that draw people in. You know, I mentioned the teenagers, we draw them in by adding the entrepreneurial side. We do all kind of public forms. Uh, public education is an important part of what we do. But the main thing is creating this example. And what we found is over time that certain people start gravitating towards that example. So I, I've always found in organizing, I try to use what I call the concentric model, concentric circle model, that there's some people that the ideas already gravitate or already resonate with. And so those people, you kind of pull them in, and that might be the choir you were talking about. Then there's the next level of people who maybe they're not quite into it, but it sounds kind of interesting, and you can, you can kind of pull them in if they see some concrete action. Now, some of those folks, it might take them five, ten years to, to get on board. I had a friend that called me this morning, and you know I've been trying to get him to join the co-op since 2014. And he's like, you know, I haven't joined yet, but how do you go about? So it's taken him literally nine years to come around. But because we were consistent and we had the vehicle in place, he finally now he's coming around. We're still there for him to join. So consistency is part of it. Uh, moving with integrity. That's probably the most important thing. Uh, that's probably the most important thing. And uh, because people need to see us as being honest as not being self-promoting, as working for the interest of the people. And typically when people recognize that, they're going to be supportive. And so those are some of the things I would say that we can do to begin to win people over. OK, we have two questions. And I think we have, who hasn't asked a, You have not asked a public question, right? So I'm going to have you, and then if we have time, we'll get to the other two. Um, Malik, you have so much wisdom to share, and I'm going to ask you if you can keep it short, short and sweet. Short and the wisdom. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, so two things you mentioned. One was, you know, having a conflict, but eventually, you know, sort of having a resolution. And you also mentioned, like, historical trauma with the land. And, you know, I've had experiences with um, black farmers that, still had that trauma and were enacting it on the people that were working it. So exploitative relationships to the land, exploitative relationships to the people that are working in the land. And so I guess my question is, is like dealing with that and, and wanting to keep everything in house and, and not wanting to like put out black people's business and, and all that kind of stuff. Like, do you have any sort of like conflict resolution um, skill or like tips or, or thoughts about like 
um, dealing with folks in the food sovereignty realm that are still enacting like historical trauma and like doing really harmful things like to their fellow black person? Well, I'll say that all of us are impacted by that trauma and none of us have arrived where we've gotten past it, right? So all of us are still enacting harm unintentionally on people because we haven't totally transformed ourselves. And so being dedicated to your own personal transformation, and when I say personal transformation, nobody transforms individually. We do it in community. But being committed to your own transformation within the context of community is important, but also seeing healing as being an essential part of the work. It's not, it's not a marginal part of the work. It's at the core of the work. In fact, some people say that is the work, right? The, the healing is the work. So intentionally finding ways to incorporate that into the work, that includes enacting policies in organizations or in, in farms that, uh, that prioritize the well-being of the people who are doing the work, uh, that prioritize the humanity of the people who are doing the work, and that can come in various forms. For example, uh, for the people who work at our farm who are part-time workers, we, we can't afford to provide health care. We, we wish we could, but we can't. And so we, so we struggle with, well, what do we do then? So we offered a $500 wellness stipend, which clearly is not enough, right? But it's a step in the direction of saying that we realize, that we recognize your humanity. We want to offer this if you want to go get massage therapy, if you want to go to counseling, whatever you want to use it for. So doing things like that to prioritize the well-being of the people doing the work, I think, is, is important. And then also, I'll say in our organization, as in many organizations, we've had some conflict related to gender and sexuality. And so this past two weeks, we've had sessions where we brought in a consultant who, um, who put within historical context uh, the, the gender diversity that exists within humanity and particularly within an African cultural context because there's many people who, who have said, well, oh, homosexuality was brought to Africa by Europeans, right? And you know, just dispelling all that, that that's not the case. Uh, so you know, having those trainings, I think, is important. And you know, gender and sexuality is one aspect, but there's many aspects uh, that need to be addressed that might be the cause of conflict within organizations. Being on a path of continuous growth and being honest enough to, and open enough to grow you know, I, both individually and collectively as an organization, I think is very important. I really feel like we should thank you for your time and your expertise. No, thank you. Thank you all.